Well, good morning, Shiloh. It's so good to see you as we gather in for worship this morning on an absolutely incredible, amazing, wonderful, and beautiful morning. Amen? Amen. Listen, the pastor starts getting excited when he wakes up and the temperature's in the upper 50s. I love it. That's my kind of weather right there. And uh, spring and fall are my favorites. We, we love every season because the Lord gives them to us. But I love fall particularly. And, uh, and uh, what a beautiful day the Lord's given us to gather and worship as his people. I wanted to start off with a word of scripture to you this morning out of the 90th Psalm. And this is what it says. Lord, you have been our dwelling place. In all generations. Isn't that a good word? You know, all through history, there have been times of chaos and turmoil. Just like what we're seeing in the United States over these last months and years. But God's people always know this. You have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth. Or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Amen. Amen. Today we're going to be talking about the sovereignty of God. And what a beautiful passage to remind us of that. But I'm so glad that you're here to worship the Lord with us today. Um, if you are visiting with us today, if you're our guest, we would love to have a record of your visit and so in the worship bulletin is a little tear-off section called the Connection Card. If you would take a moment and fill that out, um, tear it out, and then at the end of the service as you're leaving, there, there are baskets in the foyer and over uh, at the doors as you exit out on this side of the building um, where you can drop your offerings and tithes, and you can also drop these Connection Cards in those baskets. But if you would take a moment and fill that out, We'd love to have a record of your visit with us today. I'd love to know that you were here, be able to pray for you. And uh, if you have a special prayer need, um, there are times we all have something that we say, you know, I just could really use someone praying for me this week. If you have a special prayer need this week, let us know by filling out that prayer request section on the back of that same connection card. Again, just tear it out, drop it in those baskets. We'll get those. I've already had one handed to me this morning. And uh, we will certainly pray over all those requests. And we thank you for taking the time to do that. Would you turn around, look at everybody and give them a wave and a big smile. It sure is good to see all our folks. You know, it was exciting today. Today we're more opened up than we've been since COVID shut us down back in March. Um, today, we, um, as we start a new church year, we got uh, some of our classes back. Um, children's church will be taking place during the worship service. So I'm thankful. We want to remain prayerful um, and just walk through these days being prayerful and, and we'll be as safe as we can. And we'll trust the Lord to lead us one step at a time. Amen. But we're much further than we were. So we thank God for that. And I look forward to what he's going to do in our hearts and our lives today. And I know you are as well. I'm, I'm excited and ready to begin worship. So Benji, you come on and lead us this morning. I'll ask that you stand as we sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Jesus, Son, 
be with a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious love. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my Corinthians chapter 4 verses, uh, I've got a few verses here, but they're not very long. Um, but I want you to look at the, the, the how Paul in his second letter to the Corinthians describes their endeavors. He says in verse 8, we are pressured in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. And in verse 16, he says, therefore, we do not give up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. And I think what made it possible for, for Paul and his, his crew to endure the persecution and the, the trials and rejection was prayer. Um, and even today, whatever you may be dealing with, you can keep fighting on your knees in prayer to the God of heaven's armies. Amen. There's a song that I want to share with you. The, the lyrics, um, this, this last verse is not very well known, but you'll recognize it by the chorus. But here's the verse. It says, are you laid aside from service, body worn from toil and care? You can still be in the battle in the sacred place of prayer. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. Would you pray with me? Father God, we love you so very much. And we thank you this morning for the opportunity that we have just to just to sing songs of praise to you, God, just to lift up your name um, in, in honor. And, and just, Lord, we give you the glory for everything that's done today. God, I pray that we would remember even such a basic, uh, a basic thing that we have um, on earth, Lord, is prayer. But, but we can use that to connect with you, God. And I just pray that you would help us all to just remember that it is a sacred place that we can go to just where we can spend one-on-one -on -one time with you, Father. And that to never forget... Um, just, the, just the relationship that we have with you in prayer. So I, I just pray that, uh, that as we go forward, that that's a practice we would all um, seek to grow in, Lord. And we ask all of these things in your holy and precious name. Amen. All right. I have asked Miss Rhonda to come and have our children's message for us today. I'll be back. Uh, to all our children, I'll be back doing the children's message next week. Miss Rhonda's going to help me out this morning, and I sure appreciate her so very much. Miss Rhonda? Good morning. All right, where are our kids? We've got a few. There's a few back there. All right. Everybody know what this is? Mm -hmm. It's a box of what? Crayons. What do you
what do you do with a crayon? You color, right? How many of you color? Do you color at school? Yeah. Yeah, you color pictures. You make them really pretty. All right, we're gonna talk about crayons because all of you have started back to school. Did you get a box of new crayons to go back to school? Yeah? Okay, did you get crayons? <laughs> you guess? Okay, well, I thought everybody would have new crayons to go back to school. All right, so when we open the box of crayons, we have yellow, and we have pink, and we have red, and we have green, and uh-oh, I'm missing the color. I'm missing the color blue. Well, you know, if we don't have a blue crayon, then we couldn't color the sky. We couldn't color the ocean. We couldn't color a blue fish or even blue eyes. Hmm, that's a pretty important color, isn't it? The color blue? Yeah? You know what that reminds me of? It's like a Christian friends. All right, think about it. Everybody has something unique to offer God. Just like our green crayon is used for the grass. Or the yellow crayon is used for the sun. God uses each one of us in a special way too. You know, the Bible says that God gives each one of us different gifts. Romans chapter 12 verse 6 says, according to the grace he has given us, we have different gifts. So just like all of the crayons have a different purpose, God has a different purpose for each one of us. And when we, ha we don't have our friends here, we miss them, don't we? Yeah. We have some friends who are encouragers. Some are singers. Some are really good at sharing Bible stories. So we all work together for the glory of God. And if we look hard, we might just find that blue crown. Okay. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for each one of our children that are here today. Thank you, Lord, that you have a unique purpose for each one of us. You have given us gifts and talents to use for you. And just like the crayons all have a unique purpose, you use us for a unique purpose for you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. felt pressed to do this song about three weeks ago, and it goes right with our Sunday school lesson that we had this morning. So I hope it speaks to you guys.
for his daily sufficient grace. Amen. I lean on it every day. Uh, we were discussing that in, in the Sunday school class this morning, how, you know, as believers, uh, we, still, we still battle our fleshly nature. We fall. We mess up. We continue to battle and all sin nature, but but when we know the Lord, when our sins are forgiven, we can walk every day in that fresh forgiveness and repentance and keep going, keeping our eyes on Jesus. And that's what the Christian life is. But I'm so thankful for that sufficient grace. Thank you, Amy. What a beautiful song. And uh, I just appreciate Amy and Rhonda sharing in the children's message this morning. And it's wonderful to see uh, our church family serving in so many different ways. And uh, I'm thankful for each one of you. And as we begin a new church year today, as we uh, kick off a new church year, uh, I'm praying that this will be our strongest year yet. I pray that every year. And I don't see anything wrong with praying that. Amen. I, I pray it's a great year in giving and in serving. I pray it's a great year in seeing people come to faith. In the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray it's a great year. That we share our faith and our testimony. With as many people as we can. I pray it's a great year. Where we invite people to church. And let me just say. Yes you know there's been a little virus. Going on this year in case you didn't know that. But. We still want to invite people to church. Amen. Uh, we, we've not closed down. We still have a mission. To complete. And as far as I can tell, when I read my Bible, that mission carries on until Jesus raptures us out of here or calls us home. Amen. And so we want to be faithful to the Lord's work. I wanted to uh, mention a couple things to you. And over the month of September, you will be hearing more about it. But today we begin the week of prayer for our golden offering for Tennessee missions. And I mentioned that to you to ask you. Uh, to pick up a prayer guide. It looks like this. And you can find them on the table right outside the door there. There's a table as you go through that door just to the left. And these prayer guides are there. And uh, it will lead you through this week. And as you pray for our golden offering for Tennessee Missions, it will help you realize why that offering is so important. Because you'll be praying about specific areas of ministry that... Tennessee Baptists are involved in and um, I am thrilled to say that this past fiscal church year we broke all records for the golden offering for Tennessee missions even with the COVID virus praise the Lord amen and uh, I believe the the um, the last figure I saw was one million nine hundred almost nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the golden offering for Tennessee missions for the last fiscal year well Today begins a new fiscal year for that offering. Uh, we always promote that offering during the month of September. And over the next few weeks, you'll get to see some videos. And we'll talk about why that offering is so important. But um, do pick up a prayer guide today and begin praying, asking the Lord to lay on your heart. I would encourage you as all our missions offerings to give generously. Whenever you give to the Lord's work, you cannot outgive God. Um, the church that always has a heart for missions and stirs a heart for missions and is involved in missions, God's hand will always be on that church. If we ever begin to lose our heart for missions, we'll begin to lose our church. Amen? Because we must be about what God has told us to, to be about and to do the work that he's called us to do. There's another piece out there on that table because you hear us as Southern Baptists, if you're not... If you weren't raised Southern Baptist, you may or may not know what the cooperative program is. But listen, Southern Baptists are able to do so much right here at home in the United States and around the world because they cooperate and churches work together. We're able to do much more together than we would be individually. Amen. And so there's another piece out there that explains the cooperative program and why it's so important. And I'll be sharing more about this over this month. So, But let me encourage you. This is a wonderful piece done very well. And it explains it. Kind of puts talks about a farm. We have some farmers in our church. 
So you ought to understand that very well. But let me encourage you to pick up one of these and uh, read and, and study that a little bit. There are also uh, special offering envelopes out there for our Tennessee Golden Offering uh, this year. So we'll be talking more about that. But I wanted to call those things to your attention this morning and ask you to already be praying about what you will give this year to the Golden Offering for Tennessee Missions. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open them up. We're going to be in the book of Daniel today. In fact, um, you may want to, if your Bible has a ribbon, or you may want to stick a ribbon over near Daniel, because we're going to be in Daniel for, for the next uh, two to three months as we um, preach a sermon series through the book of Daniel. Um, something that's been on my heart for quite some time. People always are asking about end times and and, um, you know, what is going on in our world, how that relates to what we read in the Bible. And so the Lord's had on my heart for quite some time to preach through the book of Daniel. And as we come to the last chapters of Daniel, it becomes very prophetic. And then uh, we'll take a break and we'll celebrate Christmas around Shiloh. And then in January, um, I... I plan, my plan is to begin preaching through the book of Revelation in January. And I don't know how many weeks that will be, but we will take our time and walk through the book of Revelation together and try to understand the times we're in and uh, what God is saying to us. You know, the book of Revelation says that if you read and study that book, you will be blessed. And so I'm excited about that because I want that blessing. Amen. And so we're going to do that together. But today we begin our journey through the book of Daniel. And so what a timely, um, what a timely message as we begin to think. Because how many of you would agree that we live in chaotic times? 2020, I'm sure has been one of your favorite years. Uh, I saw something the other day, one of those Facebook memes that um, depicts 2020 and it was a tennis court and on one side of the tennis court was a player and they had their stance and they were ready for the ball to be served and they were ready but the only problem was on the other side of the net on the other tennis court the one serving was an army tank and he had his cannon pointed ready to serve the player on the other side and that said 2020 and that's kind of the way 2020 came in would you agree uh, it's been a chaotic year in more ways than one, not only with uh, COVID-19, but with um, and elections coming up and all the political uh, rhetoric and turmoil and propaganda we see and, and uh, uh, the riots that we've seen around our nation and our cities. And, and uh, there's so much going on. It can become so incredibly overwhelming. When we come to the book of Daniel... I see a young man who also walked through some very tumultuous times, heart-wrenching times in, in this young man's life. And yet, in the midst of it all, his faith was uncompromising. And there is much that Daniel can teach us about how we live in tumultuous times, in times that we uh, may not understand. And so... I want us to look at it just to give you a little bit of background before we read chapter 1 in Daniel. Just to give you a little bit of background of what is going on. As we begin this study, it, it, it's in times like these, times like we're living, that we need to be reminded that our God is sovereign. Amen. And that he is faithful to his people. He always is. And knowing that our God reigns, that he is sovereign, he is holy, he is all-powerful, he is just, he is a God of love, grace, and mercy, we can place all of our confidence in him in tumultuous times and have an uncompromising faith. Daniel was born during the middle of Josiah, King Josiah's reign. I was talking to Brother Scott Williams over there who had a grandbaby this week. And we are so tickled 
uh, for Scott and Yvonne and, and Allie and Mark. And the baby's name is Josiah. And that hit my brain this morning. I said, well, well Scott, I'm going to be talking about King Josiah this morning. And King Josiah was a godly king. He was a good king. Interesting thing about King Josiah is he came to the throne at the age of eight. Eight years old. And some, about some eight years into his reign, Josiah began to seek the Lord. And um, there, there is one passage of scripture that tells us Josiah as, as, the, as the, uh, the, the word of the Lord was brought to him. And as he began to read the word of the Lord, his heart was broken that his people had wandered so far away from God and the things of God. And he spent the rest of his reign trying to turn the people's hearts back to God. Josiah was a good king. But then his reign ended. When we pick up in Daniel chapter 1, um, the next king to come on the scene was Jehoiakim. And he became the king of Judah. Jehoiakim did not have a heart that sought God. And we're going to see the results of that. But just to give you a little more information, Daniel grew up during the king's reforms. He was born during Josiah's reign. And then um, during that time, he probably heard the prophet Jeremiah. Uh, he even quoted Jeremiah in chapter 9 and verse 2 of, of Daniel. And then in 609 BC, Josiah was killed. King Josiah was killed in a battle against Egypt. And within four years, the southern kingdom of Judah had returned to its evil ways. How quickly a nation can turn around and fall. Within four years of Josiah's death, the southern kingdom of Judah had returned to its evil ways. In 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar became king of Babylonia. And in September of that year, he swept into Palestine and surrounded Jerusalem, making Judah his vassal state. To demonstrate his dominance, Nebuchadnezzar took many of Jerusalem's wisest men and most beautiful women to Babylon as captives. Daniel was in that group. So this young man, teenage, a teenager in years, was taken from his homeland and was taken captive to Babylon. And if you can imagine something so horrible is that it would be the it would be the equivalent of a foreign nation coming into the United States and taking control and then taking part of us captive to some foreign land foreign culture unlike anything we had ever known that is what Daniel experienced and so now let's go to the scripture let's pray and then let's read Daniel's account here Father, we pray that as we look into your word today, God, that your Holy Spirit would teach us and lead us and guide us. Father, I pray that I wouldn't say anything contrary to your word. But Father, we pray that through your Holy Spirit, the message you have for us today would be instilled into our hearts. Help us to hear. Lord, give us ears to hear. And Father, teach us the lessons we need to know to live in these days, in tumultuous times. Remind us, God, that you are sovereign and you are faithful. Help us to be faithful to you, just as Daniel was. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And, and so when we come to chapter 1, follow along with me. The Word of God says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. So Jehoiakim had been on the throne for three years. The nation had declined. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. 
And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, little G. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. You see, this is what the prophet Jeremiah had preached about, had warned about, had tried to get the people to see that they needed to turn to the Lord. In verse 3, And then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability, ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank and three years of training for them so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names, so they changed their names. He gave Daniel the name Bel Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and the goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had said over Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah. Please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them 10 days. And at the end of ten days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill. Notice, notice that it said God gave them knowledge and skill. And all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days. When the king had said that they should be brought in. The chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And then the king interviewed them. And among them all. None was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. Quite a story. Daniel was, was barely more than a boy when the Babylonian acts fell. John Phillips said in his commentary, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, he was transformed from near royalty in Judah to iron capacity. He was but a youth. His ministry would span the entire period of the prophesied 70 year captivity of the Jews in Babylon. So he could not have been much more than a teenager when Nebuchadnezzar arrived on the scene. He was probably about 18 years of age. And so this young man, 
uh, had a lot to deal with. But we are going to learn so much from Daniel. One of the first lessons we see here in chapter 1. And it's really a hard lesson for us to learn. Is that God may sovereignly send you to difficult places. That's not a message we like to hear, is it? We, we like to think about God being a God of deliverance, a God of healing. We like to think about uh, God being faithful to answer his promises. And he is a God like that. But God in his sovereignty will also send you to difficult places to spread his name. What was the purpose of Daniel being taken captive, captive in Babylon? Well, God would make his name known even among the Babylonians through Daniel's faithfulness. And so let me ask you a question. Would God really send you to a difficult place? Would he really send you to a difficult place? As we study the scripture, the answer would be yes, wouldn't it? Yes, he would. Some of you have walked through some very difficult times. And I would dare say, as you look back and think back, you can look and see how God strengthened your faith during those times. Probably drew you closer to himself during those times than you've ever been at any other time. And you probably saw God work in incredible ways that otherwise you would not have seen him work. Dale Davis said, sometimes God may allow hardships to reach us because he wants his mercy to reach beyond us. Why would God allow his people to be taken captive in Babylon? Because their hearts had turned away from him. He had warned them through the prophet Jeremiah and they would not hear, they would not listen. King Josiah tried to turn them back. And, and while he was king and on the throne, it worked for the most part. But then as soon as he was off the throne, as soon as Josiah was killed, within, with, within three, four short years, they had declined and had become a wicked nation again as far as their heart for God. And so sometimes God may allow hardships to reach us because he wants his mercy to reach beyond us. It's always about God's mercy. And reaching people. God's purpose. In such hardships. Is almost always multifaceted. He always. Uh, he allows suffering. In the lives of his people. To demonstrate his sovereignty. To strengthen their faith. To show himself wise and strong. And to put his glory on display. Among the nations. That they might be drawn to him. That there is pain for us in all of this is often the case. Was it painful for Daniel to be ripped out of his home? To be taken captive as a prisoner to another in a foreign land? Absolutely. I can't imagine. But yet we see the faithfulness of God even to Daniel. Would God really see you to a difficult place in his sovereignty and in his wisdom and in his love and in his mercy? Yes, he would. Ask Abraham, who God asked him to leave his homeland, everything that he knew. Ask Noah. Ask Noah if God would lead you to a difficult place. Ask the disciples if God would lead you to a difficult place. You know, some of Jesus' words to the disciples... And, and, and it is so relevant to, to us today in walking with Jesus. These are Jesus' words to the disciples. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Isn't that an encouraging message? Preacher, that will encourage your heart. I'm sending you as sheep in the midst of wolves. Would you describe living in the United States today as a Christian, as a as a born again believer, I, you know, you can see that scripture come to life right there. Jesus sends us out as sheep in the midst of wolves. And he went on and he said, therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in the synagogues. 
You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake. How about that? We see, we see even now, we see um, uh, pastors in California struggling with the government in California. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. Would, would God deliver you up to a difficult situation for His sovereignty and for His glory to be a testimony? Absolutely, He would. Ask Stephen, who was the first Christian martyr. Would God lead you to a difficult place? For his glory, yeah, yeah, he would. You know, sometimes in American Christianity, we, we, have, we have bought into the message that to follow Christ and to be a Christian is to live in health and wealth and prosperity. But that is not the message you see in the scripture. Sometimes God leads you to difficult places for his glory. And so there Daniel found himself. The second thing I would have you to know and see from this passage of scripture today is to be prepared for the challenges non-Christian cultures will throw at you to lead you away from God. Be prepared for the challenges that non-Christian cultures will throw at you to lead you away from God. You say, Pastor, here in America, we're a Christian culture. No, we are not. No longer. We live in a post-Christian culture here in the United States of America. There was a day. There was a day as a young man in first and second grade where I said the Pledge of Allegiance. And we were taught to say the pledge. One nation under God. There was a day as a boy in, in elementary school that we opened the day in our classroom with prayer. And even some scripture reading from the word of God no longer in America unless you belong to a Christian private school. Is that the case? And so we have to be prepared for the challenges that living in a non-Christian culture throws at us. Look at what happened to Daniel and his buddies. They took them there and they, they began in a, in a sense they began to try to win their hearts over. The king chose some of the finest young people. And they brought them there. And they were going to school them for three years. In the culture. He was going to feed them some of the finest foods. From his own table. What was he doing? He was trying to win over their allegiance. That's what he was doing. And, and they even went so far as to change their names. Now, now it's interesting that you look. Do you know that in, in the Jewish culture, the names were very significant and very important? Take, for instance, Daniel. Do you know that Daniel, his name meant Elohim is my judge. Elohim is, 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 is the highest, most reverential, most holy name for God. Elohim, our sovereign God, our creator God. And so Daniel's name was Elohim is my judge. And his new name that was given to him, he had no control over it, was Belteshazzar, which means lady protect the king. So not only was he given a name, it even, in a sense, changed his gender. And the first thing the Babylonians did which changed the gender of Daniel's name, an inherent part of each person's identity. They also shifted the focus from God to human. With this new name, Daniel's identity, at least on paper, changed from a man held accountable by an all-powerful God to that of a woman who must protect her sovereign. In their culture, this was a terrible insult. The meaning of Daniel's new name was the and antithesis of his former Hebrew name. They also did that with the names of Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah. 
Hananiah's name was, his name meant Yahweh is gracious. His new name, Shadrach, meant I am fearful of God. So it went, the name, the name shifted the focus from God being a God who pursues us in love and mercy and grace and relationship to a God we should fear and be afraid of. Michelle, who is, his name meant, who is like Elohim? Who is like our God? No one can compare to our God. And they changed his name to Meshach, which means I am despised, contemptible, and humiliated. Once again, the Babylonians chose a name that subverted the goodness of God in our relationship to him. And it shifted the focus from our confidence in God to cowardice. And then there was Azariah, which his name meant Yahweh helps. His new name, Abednego, meant the servant of Nebo, which was, um, which was a Babylonian god, little g, and even a human name. Azariah went from being a son or heir of Yahweh, a term of endearment for the living God, to being a slave of another man. And they were intended to confuse these young men, to disorient them as to their true identity and who they were. And my friend, that is exactly what the culture in the United States is doing today to believers. Amen? Let me give you just a few examples of how we see that. One nation under God was taken out of the pledge at the Democratic National Convention. They said the pledge, but they took out one nation under God. Very blatantly. They didn't announce it. They just did it. But it certainly sends a strong message. Our culture today has redefined family, marriage, and sexuality. Uh, we laugh. Our culture laughs in the face of what the Bible teaches as, as the biblical uh, model of marriage and family. What God has designed and what God has set up and said about our sexuality and family and marriage. Our culture today has devalued human life. God's word lifts up human life. Talks about how every life is precious. From, from even before a mother knows that there is a child in her womb. God has known it all together. And has created that child from inception. From conception. Our culture today says that there are many ways to God. You don't have to believe in Jesus as long as you're sincere. Truth is relative. Our culture today says that there is no absolute truth. And our kids in our public schools are being indoctrinated in these thoughts and ideas. In many places around our nation. So the exact same thing that you can see happening to Daniel and his friends. Folks, we better wake up because it's happening in our culture as well. There is still an enemy and he's still up to his same old tactics. So we need to determine. Here's your third thing I want you to understand from this passage of scripture today. Determine early in your life and heart that you will not compromise your convictions and commitments to God. That's what Daniel did. And my friend, I want you to go back and I want you to read that story. Because Daniel purposed in his heart. He purposed in his heart. Listen, he had no control over them changing his name. He couldn't control that. But he purposed in his heart that they were not going to move his heart away from the one true God. How many of us have purposed in our heart? In the, in the day and the time and the culture 
that we're living in. How many of you have purpose in your heart that you will not compromise what you believe about the word of God? You will not compromise your faith. It, 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 it causes fear in this pastor's heart sometimes. That we're listening much more to the culture. And what TV says and what newscasters say and what this hostess on this talk show says and what this hostess on this talk show says and, and what, what our professors in our universities are saying. And, and we have begun to question the word of God. And we are in a dangerous place as believers when we that begins to infiltrate the church of God. We need to be a people who like Daniel purpose in our hearts that we will not be defiled. And the king, Nebuchadnezzar, he did his best. He was going to feed those boys some of the choicest of foods. I can't imagine how as a teenage young man, talk about resolve. Talk about purposing in your heart. I can't imagine how much resolve it took for Daniel. Here they are bringing some of the choicest steaks by on platters. Here they are bringing some of the finest baked goods and pastries and cakes. And, and probably their version of whatever good cookies were. I don't know. Had to be some chocolate chips in there somewhere. <laughs> and you can just imagine all of this was being paraded by Daniel and his friends. And how tempting that must have been. But Daniel wanted, he knew that some of that meat had been sacrificed to idols, had been offered to idols. And he purposed in his heart that he was not going to have anything to do with the worship of an idol. They could change his name, but they could not change his heart in serving the true and the living God. And he purposed in his heart. Have you purposed in your heart to love the Lord, to walk in obedience to his word? Have you nailed it down? Something I noticed there in chapter one. Do you notice that Daniel's commitment, his uncompromised faith influenced his friends? Did you notice that? They were there with him. Every young person, I want you to listen to him. Your faith, when you are strong in your faith, will make the difference in the lives of some of your friends. When they see you standing strong for Jesus, it will encourage them to stand strong for Jesus. Or you can just go with the flow and go with the crowd like everybody else. Daniel purposed in his heart that he was going to love the Lord and walk with the Lord. And they could not take that away from him. Have you purpose. In your heart. Max Lucado said. It is possible to be obedient to God. Even when surrounded by people. Who are disobedient to his word. The Hebrew boys. Stood strong in their faith. Despite what might, might have caused them to fear. Have you purposed in your heart. I have a dear friend. Who I love dearly. Seth. And Robin Buckley. Seth is the student pastor at First Baptist Church of Spartanburg, South Carolina. We served together for four years at Somerville Baptist Church. We met each other at Boy State in South Carolina. We were both at Boy State at the Citadel together. We were in the same city. That's where I met Seth. And it's been interesting to see how God has kept our paths crossing through the years. He's a dear brother. And I love it. And I love his story. Him and Robin, when they met as teenagers in high school, Seth come from a godly home. His dad was actually um, the lead music professor at New Orleans Seminary for a good number of years. So Seth was brought up in a godly home where God's word was respected, where it was read every day, where, where faith was a part of the way you lived your life every day. And Seth was brought up that way. So when he met Robin, he wanted, to, he wanted their relationship to honor the Lord. 
And he and Robin together decided that their relationship, they purposed in their hearts that they would always follow the Lord and honor him in their relationship as they dated. They waited for marriage in order to be intimate. And God has blessed them so richly when they married. And Seth was involved, became involved in student ministry. God has used this couple in incredible ways. And he has blessed them so mightily. They had four boys. Jacob, Caleb, Eli, and Micah. They're a biblical family. <laughs> Seth and Robin have had years together, even to this day, in some of the most powerful student ministry in all of South Carolina. Seth has been a powerful influence at Boy State since he attended with me. He's been involved every year at Boy State and moved into leadership at Boy State. Boy State in South Carolina is a spiritual experience because you're going to worship at Boy State in South Carolina. They lead in worship services. Senator Tim Scott um, is a product of going to Boy State in South Carolina. And, and he and Seth are big buddies. By the way, he's the real deal. But Seth comes from a rich heritage. Now one of his sons, Jacob, has started a ministry called Fire Pit Ranch that reaches out to, to boys in trouble and also to their dads. And they'll bring them to Fire Pit Ranch and spend a weekend or a week with them, pouring into them. And they're seeing lives transformed with the gospel of Jesus Christ. My friend, I want you to know something. When you purpose in your heart to do it God's way, how much influence that has on others and how God blesses. And we see that in the life of Daniel. He couldn't control uh, the culture and everything about him, but he could control that he had purposed in his heart to honor the Lord and to walk with him. And that's what he did. And I could give you other examples. But have you purposed in your heart? And then notice that as Daniel trusted God, God blessed him. Trust God to honor your devotion and faithfulness to him. Trust God to honor your devotion and faithfulness to him. And he will. God blessed Daniel and his friends physically. God blessed them mentally. Mentally, through all of that, they were strong. They weren't broken down mentally. God blessed them spiritually. In a different land, in a different culture, they became witnesses of the one true God. And God blessed them socially. He even gave them favor with the king. Nebuchadnezzar. And his unit. Uncompromising faith. It burdens my heart to see. Even today, how many Christians are compromising their faith? And they're listening more to the culture. I have a, I have a friend uh, who I pray for. We went to the same church together, the same student ministry together. Sat under the same Bible teaching, under the same student pastor together. My friend went to seminary. My friend became a pastor. My friend ended up going through a divorce. Fell out of. I don't, I don't know the whole story. But I know that today my friend is in a much different place and it breaks my heart. He's not involved in ministry. Goes to a church that sanctions gay marriage.
whenever we begin to listen more to the culture and how it makes everything sound and see and how it entices and tempts, whenever we move away from what we know to be the Word of God and the truth that the Bible presents, we can easily compromise our faith. Love this word with all of your heart. That's why it is so critical and important. Families listen to me. Moms, dads listen to me. Grandparents listen to me. That is why it is so critically important that your kids see that you love the word of God. That the word of God has a prominent place in your home. That you read it together. That you talk about it together. That you talk about it when you get up and when you go to bed. Just like it tells us in, in, in the Old Testament. And, and you make it such a part of your lives that you know the truths that God presents in his word. And you ingrain them in your hearts or otherwise you too could easily compromise your faith. Daniel purposed in his heart. Have you purposed in your heart? To love the Lord your God with all of your heart and not let this world water down your faith and your convictions and your stand for Christ. Would you bow your heads and pray with me this morning? The first place I would tell you you need to begin is to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and never look back. Determine in your heart that, that Jesus died on the cross for you and, and, and acknowledge your sin before him and be willing to repent of your sin and turn to Christ and follow him the rest of your days. Have you done that? Maybe this morning there's someone here and you say, Pastor, today I want to trust the Lord Jesus as my Savior and as my Lord. If you would like to do that, you can pray a prayer like this and mean it with all of your heart. It's from your heart to God's. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me so much. God, you gave your son. You gave Jesus. And I know he died on Calvary's cross for me. Right now, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin, Lord. I place my faith in you. Lord Jesus, come into my life. And help me to live for you. And to follow you from this day forward. Thank you for loving me. God, thank you for saving me. And listen, with heads bowed and eyes closed, that's where you begin. That's where you begin to, to stand on your faith and to nail it down and to know that you're committed to Christ. That your sins are forgiven, that your future is secure. And if you did that today, I want to ask you to do something. If you would, look up at just a moment and look at me. If you, if you prayed that prayer today. To trust Christ as your Savior. I want you to look at me. I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to see you and know that you did that today. Nail it down. Look at me. Believers that are here. Have you been compromising your faith? Are you growing in the word of God, in your love for the word of God, in, in your walk with Christ? Are you stronger today than you were a week ago or a month ago or a year ago? Is Jesus still the passion of your heart? If not, what has changed? Who have you been listening to? Is culture speaking into your life more than the word of God? If that's the case, would you, would you right now just have a conversation with the Lord? 
say, Lord, I purpose in my heart today. I purpose in my heart to love you and to walk with you and to begin to grow. Spend a moment with the Lord. Would you purpose in your heart? Would you purpose in your heart for yourself? Would you purpose in your heart for your family to lead them? Father, I pray that today you would have your way in our hearts and lives. May we, like Daniel, have an uncompromising faith that not only impacts our friends and our family, but makes a difference in our world. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you, God, that you were sovereign. And no matter what that no matter what is going on in our culture, you have not left your throne. And even in all the chaos, you are at work. Have your way in our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Thank you so much. And I wanted to say today, if you made a decision for Christ, take that connection card that we talked about there on the corner in your bulletin. There's a place where you can indicate any decision you made today. Would you do that? Because I want to pray for you. I would love to call you and have a conversation with you about how you can grow in Christ. Tear that connection card out and I just want to remind you to leave those in the baskets as you leave today. We sure love you. Thank you so much.